textbook, one book, yeah. Textbook, textbook, maybe two textbooks.
Everybody bathes or just me? Thank you. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama,
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Chit Ahur Ajam Antam 
Punya sloka sukirtaye, Yadopiasya nuvar vaye, Malasya veva chaminanam. And some say, now she's speaking to Krishna, Krishna's standing there and she's glorifying Krishna. Some say that the unborn is born for the glorification of pious kings. Others say he is born to please King Yadav, one of your dearest devotees. You appear in his family and Sandalwood appears in the Malayan hills. So, because the Lord's appearance in the material world is bewildering, there are different opinions about the birth and the, about the opinions about the birth of the unborn. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yada 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 Masya Dhamma Bhavati Bharata Bhutanam Hadam Masya Tadat Maham Sujanyaham Pradhikranayam Sarunam Ganasanayam Chaduskitam Dharma Samstatanataya Sambhavami Yuge Yuge Millennium after Millennium I appear for three principal reasons, but actually one principal reasons and two, what we say, secondary reasons. He mentions the, print, the secondary reasons first, and that is all to uh, re-establish religious principles and to remove <coughs> irreligion from the world, in other words, killing the demons. And, but the last one is in order to uh, inspire devotional service into the hearts of his devotees and to give his association to those who have dedicated their lives to his service. And that is the primary reason, as Srila Prabhupada explains many times in his lectures, that as far as establishing the religious principles, the Lord can do that through his empowered representatives and spiritual teachers. And he does that from time to time. He sends a great soul in order to establish religious principles. And then, it's done. And then, also, to kill demons, <coughs> he doesn't have to come personally to them. He can simply create a material catastrophe when so many demons are killed. But to enliven his devotees and to inspire them by his personal association, he comes personally. So that is the primary reason why he comes. But the Bhagavatam gives so many different reasons, and they're all correct why the Lord comes to the material world. Sometimes people uh, ignorantly say, well, why, should the, why should the Lord come to this material world? Or they even say the Lord can't come to the material world. But if he wants to, he can come. And he also gives the reasons why he comes. And the main reason is to give inspiration to his devotees. So here he's called the unborn, although he takes birth. So it appears, it appears to be a contradiction in terms of how come someone who is unborn, never born, never takes birth, but takes birth. And that is a great mystery. So we understand the process of birth is done in a certain way in the material world. And the Lord appears somewhat similar to that, but it's completely different. He doesn't appear like an ordinary condition soul, like you know, between union of men and women, although it looks like the same thing. He descends into the hearts of his devotees, appears in their minds through their pure devotional service, and then appears in his personal form as he is. And that way, it looks like, in order to bewilder the atheist class of men, who may think that the Lord is just another personality, or among, we might say, just someone who is a little exceptionally empowered. So he keeps somewhat of that uh, ignorance alive in their minds because they have no devotion. You can't understand the Lord unless you have devotion. The rituals, various types of procedures to worship the Lord will not really give us an understanding of the Lord. Only in Krishna says, Bhakti Mama Vajanati, only by devotional service is I, can I be understood. And Krishna really qualifies that. He says only when devotional service is of two natures, or two qualities, 
What are those qualities? I hate to key of the time. When there's no other motivation but to serve the Lord, and then that same service is not interrupted by material activities. So this is the, what we say, the principle or the platform for realizing the position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in relationship to our, to us and to everything else. So it is bhakti. So he appears in the hearts of his pure devotees in order to inspire them in devotional service. So Queen Kuti is a great devotee of the Lord. She's Krishna's aunt, aunt. And she's trying to enlighten us by con making conjectural statements of how the Lord actually appears. In the next verse, she says, others, some say you come in order to you know, please King Yadu, you appear in that family. And that is also true. But then others say, they give another reason, that since both Vasudeva and Devaki prayed for you, you have taken birth as their son. Undoubtedly you are unborn, yet you take birth for their welfare and to kill those who are envious of the demigods. So we read in the, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam in the very beginning of the 10th canto about the appearance of the Lord. And it says that at that particular time in history, the world was overburdened with what, irreligious forces or demoniac forces. And therefore, on the petition of the demigods who could not deal with the, what we say, the demigods, they have this responsibility to make sure that uh, the functions of the universal affairs go on. In other words, that people live a pious life. When people live an impious life, the whole society goes down. And impiety leads, leads to sinful life, and sinful life leads to degraded life. Degraded life leads to an impossible situation in the world. When it becomes so, what we say, degraded, <laughs> then there has to be something done on a higher level to order to rectify this anomaly. So then, um, sometimes the Lord sends his pure devotee, or sometimes he sends something to do it. But in certain cases, he has to come himself. So therefore, it mentions that the demigods, headed by King Enter, approached Lord Brahma, with the situation that the world was overburdened with demoniac forces. So you might understand, you might say, well, how, what was the history? How did that come about? And that's a very interesting history. And it's mentioned in the Mahabharata, wherein in the great powerful manifestation or incarnation of the Lord known as Parasaram, he did not like uh, envious rulers, or proud rulers. The nature of Kshatriyas is that they have a tendency to become proud. All living entities have a tendency to become proud about something about themselves or something that they do. But especially rulers, they have this pride because they think, I am the ruler. <laughs> and they think it's people are dependent on them to the rule. So, the Lord incarnated to remove this, what we say, irreligious pride in the hearts of all these kings. And then Parasaram didn't preach, he simply took up his axe and killed all these kings. 21 generations of Kshatriya kings were destroyed. And now, after that was done, the world was in a pretty, what we say, unmanageable state. There was nothing to rule the world. So what, what to do? So the sages who are concerned about how the welfare of the people got together to decide, along with the sale of the, the, the royal families that were remaining, what should we do to reestablish a saintly rule on the earth? So they made an unusual plan unusual in the sense that it wasn't done before. They decided that we wanted, we need to 
create a class of Rajarsis, Rajarishi. Raja means king and Rishi means sage. Those sages, or those kings, that are, are guided by religious principles, who actually are religious themselves. And of course, we have a great history. King used there, uh, Maharaj Parikshit, uh, what is that other great king? Uh, so many. Um, one in the fourth canto. Um, Barish Maharaj, too, yeah, I was thinking of. Okay, who's that great king? Janak Maharaj. No, yeah, these are all great kings. Ritu Maharaj. Uh, I can't think of his name. It's in the fourth canto, the whole story of this role. He's the one that chastised the earth. Huh? Oh, okay. Chastise what? Chastise the earth for withholding the uh, king. Pritu. Pritu. Yeah, Pritu Maharaj. Yeah. Saying, yeah. Pritu Maharaj. So these were ra Rajarishis. Nowadays, what do we have? <laughs> it's a little different, right? There's no, there's no Rishi there, neither outside or inside. <laughs> and Raja, that's a really loose term right now. There's no Rajas either. No real king. A king is the one who has what we call the welfare of the citizens as their motivation for their rule. Nowadays, their motivations are not. It's all politics. It's about conquering other lands, it's about increasing economic development, it's about increasing sense gratification, it's about uh, somehow or other filling their pockets with more and more, uh, you know, money, or more and more wealth in different ways. So they guise themselves as representatives of the people, but their whole motivation is mostly for their own sense gratification. And they fight amongst each other, as you see today. They're always fighting. Nobody agrees with anyone. <laughs> and even if they do agree, it's all about sense gratification. It's today's world. So we have a history of Vedic kings. So how did these kings come about? So the sages decided to do, make a great sacrifice. So they had union with these princesses. The great sages took up marriage with these princesses and created a, a whole line, lineage, heritage of saintly kings. And now, after hundreds of years, the rule of the world was reestablished as a saintly rule. It went on. But this is the material world. And the material world means nothing is constant. Material world means everything is always moving towards the material, away from the spiritual. Unless one is endeavoring for the spiritual, the material world naturally, automatically, imperceptibly take over the spiritual. That's why spiritual life is a constant effort towards Krishna. If we are not constantly trying to become Krishna consciousness, the material energy pushes you the other way, away from Krishna towards material consciousness. That is how this world works. So after some time, a great war broke out in the heavenly planets between the demigods and the demons. Now the demons were looking for some base that they could use to fight the demigods. Guess what? They choose Mother Bumi. So the demigod demons took took birth of different species of life in order to again take control of the earth. And there is where we begin the history of Krishna's descent. So then the whole world again became overburdened with demoniac forces. And you see. 
Krishna killed demons in all kinds of forms. There were snakes, there were horses, there were bulls, there were what else? Uh, yeah, so many different forms of demons that Krishna killed. They were all very powerful rakshasas who were servants of King Kamsa. And Kamsa was the leader. So now you have what is called a very impossible situation. And then Krishna takes place. And we all know the story. It's a very long history and how Krishna appeared. As the son of Vasudeva and Devaki appeared in a jail cell. He appeared in a jail cell. It's interesting. God is born in jail. We worship an inmate. He's the best of all inmates. We don't have to preach to him. <laughs> he preaches to us. <laughs> so it's interesting. He takes his birth in a very obscure way, but it's suitable for his particular time. Now Krishna didn't want to stay in that position any longer. He wanted to go to Vrindavan. So there's a beautiful verse. It's actually coming from the ninth canto. So I'll read that verse. And this is pretty much the topic we'll focus on. It says, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, known as Leela Purushottam. So the best of all personalities. Purushottam means the best. Appeared as the son of Vasudev, but immediately left his father's home and went to Vrindavan to expand his loving relationship with his confidential devotees. In Vrindavan, the Lord killed many demons, and after he returned to Dwarka, where according to the Vedic principles, he married many wives who were the best of women, he got through them hundreds of sons and performed sacrifices for his own worship and established the principles of householder life. So there's so many other reasons why Krishna appeared is to establish what is the ideal household life. We can learn from the example of Lord Krishna, although we cannot follow that example exactly in our own life because there are certain things he does, like married 16,100 named queens. If you try that today, you won't get very far, and you have a lot of alimony to pay. <laughs> so, even if you are, you know, you know, an heir to the Trump estate, still you'll be paying a lot of money. <laughs> so, it's not that you can imitate his household life, but he does teach some basic principles on how to live in household life in such a way that religious principles remain prominent. And that's the most important thing. Household life means to gravitate down to the idea of I am I. Janasa Mohamya Mahambameti. This is my wife. This is my husband. This is my child. This is my home. This is my computer, my dog, my garage, my bank balance, my. Mm -hmm. This I and my principle is the consciousness of the materialistic. The Lord, he says, <laughs> Nothing is mine. Nothing but nothing belongs to me, but Krishna has given me these things. Why? To be able to use in his service or to maintain one's existence in this material world. Combination of both. He gives us all these things, and then he expects us to live happily so we can worship him in devotional service and use that facility and the time that he gives us as a way to elevate our consciousness towards devotional service. So he also teaches that. But here it mentions, and this is very significant, Krishna wasn't satisfied simply living and staying in the jail cell, although he, he, he was unharmed. Kamsa could not kill him. Krishna is not unkillable. He's unborn, therefore he doesn't die. He cannot be killed by anything. In fact, he is the source of all existence, and therefore everything works under his control. But still, 
he has a desire to leave that situation and go to Vrindavan. Why? Because that is the heart of Krishna. That is the heart of Krishna. So it's mentioned here. Srila Prabhupada mentions it in the purport. The real purpose of Krishna's appearance was to manifest how one can take part in loving affairs with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Reciprocation of loving affairs and ecstasy are possible only in Vrindavan. Therefore, just after his appearance, the son of Vasudev, the Lord immediately left for Vrindavan. In Vrindavan, the Lord not only took part in loving affairs with his father and mother, the gopis and the cowherd boys, but he also gave liberation to many demons by killing them. This, the, this was fully exhibited by his personal behavior. Therefore, it is to be concluded that the absolute truth is Purusha, a person. The impersonal feature of the Lord is, his, is one of his features, but ultimately he is the first person. Not only is he a person, but he is Lila Purushottam, the best of all persons. So in order to expand his loving affairs, he immediately left and he, and he created the situation where he could actually escape from the jail. After he appeared in the jail cell, he appeared as Vasudev Krishna. After, um, after the eighth child was born, Devaki saw in front of her this little baby. But then after the baby, all of a sudden changed into a baby, but dressed in yellow garments with crowns, jewelry, earrings, bangles, and very nice ornaments with a peacock feather. Then she realized her son was the actual Supreme Personality of Godhead. She offered her obeisances and worshipped him, but at the same time, her motherly affection was not what we say dwarfed by his appearance as the Lord. And so she said, my dear Lord, you have to hide yourself because if Kamsa sees you like that, he'll come and he'll kill you. Now, there's God standing in front of her. She's worshipping him, but then the motherly love overshadows the Aishwarya, the mood of awe and reverence, and she says, I'm afraid for you. <laughs> this is wonderful, huh? The motherly affection. And Krishna likes that. Krishna likes that. So Krishna returned as a baby. But then, the news didn't get to Kamsa. And so Krishna decided to escape before Kamsa found out. So it was late at night. And Krishna got all the guards to fall asleep. All the chains fell away. From Vasudev. And the doors of the cells automatically opened. Vasudev understood what to do, so he took little baby Krishna out of there so he could hide him. And where? So Krishna inspired him, go to the dominant. So Krishna's in the heart, as they say in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya Hamridi Sani Vista, Matat Smirti Gyanam Apoanam Cha. So if you want to remember something, that's Krishna. If you want to forget something, that's Krishna. If you want some knowledge, that's Krishna. He fulfills your desires accordingly and provides whatever that, that desire is. So therefore, the materialists, some of them can remain very strong atheists and they can give good arguments why there is no God. Why? Because Krishna is giving them the intelligence to come up with these ideas and theories which they seem to be very convincing to themselves and to a few other people that there is no God. And they can even write books about it. Now where does that knowledge come from? From Krishna. So he's fulfilling the desires. But for his devotees, if the devotee wants to love Krishna, Krishna shows that devotee how best they can show their love according to the intensity of your, your desire. The stronger you desire Krishna, the more he gives you the intelligence on how to fulfill that desire in devotional service. So now, Vasudeva is carrying him, and it's late at night, 
and there's a storm, it's raining, and to get to Vrindavan, Vasudev has to cross the Jamuna. Now, he's wading across the Jamuna, he's waist deep in water, and he's carrying Krishna. But Krishna decides to do something. The Jamuna River is splashing up, and her waves are hitting baby Krishna. So she wants to get the dust of his lotus feet. So Jamuna is having an ecstatic uh, experience seeing Krishna in her water. So Krishna really wanted to reciprocate her love, so he fell out of the hands of Vasudeva into the Jamuna, <laughs> just to give Jamuna an extra bit of mercy. And then Vasudeva, of course, could not understand that. So now he's, he's kind of frantically in anxiety, what happened to Krishna? So he's trying to find Krishna in the water, and he finds Krishna in the water, he picks him up, and Krishna's smiling. <laughs> and though he's a baby, he still smiles. Not too many babies smile. <laughs> Even when they're with their mothers, it's yeah. <laughs> they get a little older, they smile sometimes. But sometimes you see a nice baby so. smiling sometimes. So. <laughs> but so Krishna, and then Vasudeva rises, and it's like the middle of the night. Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda. Nanda's sleeping, Yasoda's sleeping. Yasoda just had, just gave birth. And according to what was apparent, she gave birth to a girl. But actually she didn't. She gave birth to a boy and a girl. But because she fell asleep after childbirth, she only realized there was a girl, one, one person. So, but Krishna was in this unmanifested form at the time of the birth. So Krishna took birth in two places at the same time. The Acharyas mentioned that. Not only did he take birth in the jail cell, but he appeared as the son of Yasoda. So here the mother Yasoda is not the foster mother, she's actually the real mother of Krishna. That's why he's called Nanda Nandana or Yasoda Nandana. So Vasudev, he comes, he sees two babies, one boy and one no, he sees only one baby. He sees a girl. He doesn't see. So he puts down Vasudeva Krishna and picks up the girl. He exchanges. Now, as soon as Vasudeva Krishna came to Vrindavan, he merged into the body of Vrindavan Krishna. They became one. <laughs> and they became one. And then he takes the girl. And now he's moving his way back to the jail cell, he arrives, as soon as he gets back, all the jails are locked again, the chains come. The next morning, the guards wake up, they, they notify Kamsa, oh Kamsa, the eighth child has been born. So Kamsa, he's, uh, he's beyond himself with fear. Ah, the prophecy has now manifested, that eighth child is there, so I have to take action. So he comes to the jail cell. But, David keeps holding a girl. It's not a boy. She says to her brother, my dear brother, it's a girl. But Kamsa can't figure it out. What happened? So he doesn't want to take any chances. So he rips the girl out of her hand and is about to dash her on the rock. But as he does, she slips out of his hand, flies in the sky, and manifests an eight-armed form. And she says, you fool. So, the cause of your death has already appeared. You're gonna, you can't kill me. And so she chastises him in so many ways. She's actually Durga Devi, but she manifests herself in eight different forms according to how people worship. And she's Vijay, she's Chandi, she is uh, Ambika, and so many different forms of Durga Devi. So Kamsa sees his worshipable Lord in the form of Durga Devi, and she's chastising him. Now he becomes a little humble, a little remorseful. He peed, and he gives the girl back to his sisters and apologizes. And he says, oh, I, I made so many mistakes. When these demons apologize, why do they apologize? There's no real apology there. But because he was defeated, he decided to become a little bit 
Uh, he wanted to be a nice guy for a little while. <laughs> Can't trust the demons. So that was Kamsa. Now Krishna's in Vrindavan. And Krishna is happy, and now he's performing his pastimes in Vrindavan. So here, there's another statement. You know, I'll mention something. The Krishna goes on to say, and this is a little bit more relevant to us, and yet others say you appear to rejuvenate devotional service of hearing, remembering, worshipping, and so on, in order that the conditioned souls suffering from material pangs might take advantage and gain liberation. So Krishna also comes in order to inspire the whole process of devotional service. We see that, how he does that through his representative, when a great spiritual person comes to the material world, their only business is to somehow or other inspire the conditioned souls to take up devotional service. And in this age, Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. So Krishna has come in the form of what? Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So the Lord manifests himself in his form as the name. The name of the Lord and the Lord are not different. Uh, yeah, what is that? Name, Nama Chintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purnya Puna Sudya Nitya Mukta Abhinna Tvam Nami Nami No Abhinna, Abhinna means different Abhinna means not different So Nam and Nami Name and the person who is named So the name of the person and the person who is named is the same it doesn't work for you. <laughs> your name is not you. You can change your name and you still remain who you are. And you can have many names. Krishna has many names too, of course. But the, the, yeah, the idea is that we are always in relationship to something about ourselves. Our body, our, our friends, our family, everything is in relationship. But in the spiritual world, everything is abhinna, non-different. So Krishna's name is Krishna. It's non-different. When one of Srila Prabhupada's senior sannyasis was giving a lecture, sometimes Srila Prabhupada would sit there and uh, listen to the lectures of his devotees just to see how much they knew the philosophy. You can imagine what it'd be like to sitting there and having Prabhupada listen to you and give a speech. It would be pretty, I don't know, what's the word? Scary? <laughs> Nerve wracking. Nerve wracking. But this devotee was speaking and he said, he got to one point, he was speaking about Krishna's name. And he said, Krishna is in his holy name. And Prabhupada stopped him. He said, where in his name is he? <laughs> the point is, Krishna is not in his name. He is his name. <laughs> so to think that the name is simply an identity of Krishna is also, what we say, incorrect. Krishna's name is Krishna. As the deity is not different, Prashadam is also non-different. Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of Krishna. It's non-different than Krishna. So in the same way, especially the holy name, because the holy name is empowered with Nijasarva Shaktis, all the energies of Krishna are found in his holy name. So when you're chanting the holy names of the Lord, you're actually taking the opportunity to associate directly with the Supreme Personality of Godhead through sound vibration. So this chanting of the Holy Name is not a ritual. It's not something we do in order to fulfill some obligation. 
or to get some material benefit. It is a way to purify the consciousness. In other words, to rid our consciousness of those things that are blocking our relationship with Krishna and opening the door to our natural devotional a natural devotional nature. So to chant Hare Krishna means to, to make an attempt to get the mercy and the association of Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And out of all the spiritual activities that one can perform in this age, the holy name remains foremost and what we say essential. It's not one of the religious practice, it is the religious practice. As uh, Sukadeva Goswami is speaking to Maharaj Pariksit, it's mentioned in the 11th canto, he says, Kalir dosha nidhi raja, asti eko mahagun, kirtana eva krishna sya, Mukta Sangam Parambhajan. That he says, My dear king, and he's speaking to speak, speaking to Kumar's uh, this age of Kali is an ocean of faults. Dosha Nidi. Nidi means ocean and dosha means faults. So many faults. Everywhere. In fact, that's all there is in this age. <laughs> There's so many problems. You solve one problem, you create two more. <laughs> you solve the transportation problem, you create the pollution problem, the insurance problem, whatever problems you have. As soon as you try to solve the transportation problem, you create so many problems just to get from one place to another. <laughs> So many, you rape the earth with natural resources. So many problems. So, yeah, that's just one example of how Kali Yuga works in such a way is that the more you try to solve a material problem with a material solution, you create two more, three more, maybe even a dozen more problems. So he says, Kalir Dosha Nidhi Ranjan, O King. Ocean of faults, so many faults. But asti echo, echo means one, mahagun. Gun means benediction. But what is that benediction? Not a small thing, maha, the best of all benedictions. Kirtana eva Krishna sya. That Krishna kirtan, you know, what does it do? Mukta sangam param bhajet. It purifies the consciousness and one can enter into the spiritual world simply through the process of Harinam Sankirtan. And it's powerful when it's done in relationship to devotional service. Although Harinam is independent of all activities, still one must, one must execute the process of Harinam along with Harinam. So what is that process as given by the spiritual master? So we follow certain principles uh, in order for us to purify our consciousness so we can chant Hare Krishna. In order to really chant Hare Krishna, you have to come to the mode of goodness. The mode of, the mode of ignorance means whatever you do, you hurt yourself and you hurt others. The mode of passion means you are simply enthusiastic for material gain. That's the mode of passion. And the mode of goodness is you've developed certain good qualities which are conducive to the worship of the Supreme Lord. So the mode of goodness is the stepping stone to transcendence. So developing these good qualities, such as humility, tolerance, patience, pridelessness, uh, service towards God and his devotees, and towards others in general, all these qualities are foundational to chanting Hare Krishna. And so as we develop these qualities and chant the holy names at the same time, then the Lord manifests more of his mercy through the chanting of the holy name. That's why the holy name, although it's, it's almost like a, 
contradiction. It says the holy name is not dependent on anything. But what does that mean? It means that on the higher stages of bhakti, all you need is to chant. That's all you need to do. But to get to the higher stages, you have to perform all these other activities which elevate your consciousness so you can come to the higher stage of just chanting Hare Krishna. Okay. We have to do seva. We have to read and study Srila Prabhupada's books. We have to worship the deity, especially for those of us who live in household life. Deity worship is essential in order to keep the consciousness directed towards Krishna and to purify the atmosphere. Having a deity in the home means that the home becomes the place of residence of the Supreme Lord. And it's no longer a home, it's a mandir. And so the home becomes a mandir when Krishna is nicely worshipped by his devotees according to basic principles and rules and regulations, keeping everything clean, clean and serving the Lord with simple loving devotion. So these are the fundamental, stable principles that are foundational to all of our advancement. But the essence of our advancement is coming from Parinam. So although we can perform all these other activities, Harinam has to be one of the activities and actually the main activity. It's foundational. That's why it's mentioned that out of all the activities of devotion, what is it? Ekavame Vilokeshna, Kumsam Dharma Svita, Bhakti Yoga, Bhagavati, Tam Nama Nama Ganari B. This is spoken by Yamaraj. Yamaraj is speaking to the Yamadudas. The Yamadudas were just defeated by the Vishnu Dudas and can't understand why there's more than one ruler within the universe. I thought you, Yamaraj, were the only ruler. We are your servants. We're carrying out your orders. We went out to carry out your orders. And what happens? These beautiful people from Siddhaloka came and destroyed our whole you know, attempt to take this sinful Ajamil to you for punishment. So who's the real ruler, you or them? Two masters doesn't work. If you have two masters, the pious will not get the benefit and the sinful will not get, you know, punished. So how could two masters be to rule? Are you the master or are they the master? If we're serving you and you're not the master, we're not going to serve you anymore. This is what the Yamadudas were saying to Yamaraj. Yamaraj is listening. He's getting a little impatient, but he's listening. Finally, they shut up. <laughs> and finally, Yamaraj says, well, okay, now you're ready to listen. Uh, actually, I'm not the, the supreme ruler, but I am the, I'm carrying out the, the rule of, for the sinful people. That's my jurisdiction. But those who are not sinful, I don't have jurisdiction over them. But they thought Ajamil was sinful, but Ajamil chanted Namabas, he chanted the holy names of Narayan. In a helpless state, he purified himself from all sinful and he was so sinful. He created and he performed so many sinful activities. He was living with a very expensive prostitute as his wife trying to fulfill all her needs for, for luxurious living. So he was committing crimes in order to get wealth, in order to support his prostitute wife. And he had so many children. Finally, the last child he named was Narayan. One great sage came to his house when his wife was pregnant. She, he told his wife, you know, you named this next child Narayan. She listened. And actually, that was the Lord. Because he had performed devotional service for him before he became debauchee, when he was a young man, he was a Paka Brahmin. He was worshipping the Lord so nicely. But somehow he fell down due to, a, what we say, a very unusual experience. But because he had done that in the previous life, he got some mercy. Therefore, he named his child Narayan. And then he was always, Narayan, come here, come Narayan, sit on my lap, Narayan, bring my shoes, Narayan, Narayan, Narayan. <laughs> so when death came, 
what did he do? He's thinking of his son, Narayan. He called Narayan, thinking his son was going to save him. But when he called, he heard the name of Narayan coming from his own mouth, and he remembered the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Narayan himself. And at that time, all the reactions of all his sinful activities were... He didn't reach pure devotional service. He just became purified from sinful reactions. Then he had to go to hardware and take another birth, and then after that birth, he went back home, back to Godhead. So the Yamadudas, they couldn't understand what was happening. But they were defeated by the Vishnu Judas. Now they're <coughs> asking, so what is, what is uh, Yamaraj saying? He says, Eitava nevalokeshmin pumsa dharma spiratrila bhakti yoga bhagavati tamdama dunaharnaribi Out of all the activities in human society, the highest activity one can perform is devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And out of all the activities and devotional service, the chanting of the holy names of the Lord is the best and highest of all activity. That's the way he responds to that. And then he explains more and more. He goes on verse after verse glorifying the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So in this narration, we can understand what a little bit of the glory of the holy name of the Lord. So one who chants the holy names of the Lord is always in the best position to get the mercy of the Lord in different forms of that mercy, whether it's protection, intelligence, understanding, purification of heart, or realization of the Supreme One. The holy name is, what is it, antiseptic and prophylactic. Prophylactic means protective. Antiseptic means it purifies one from all material contamination. So sometimes we don't really understand the power we have at our own disposal, this chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. That's why it says here, what does it say here? Happy moments, praise God, difficult moments, seek God, direct moments, quiet moments, worship God, every moment to thank God. So the best way to thank God is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. So Queen Kuti is giving us uh, the conclusion of why the Lord comes to rejuvenate the whole process of devotional service, hearing and chanting of your glories. So this is why the Lord comes to the material world. So this Janma Astami, Astami means age, Janma means uh, birth, the eighth day after the, what is it, the new moon or full moon? After the, the full moon, I think it is. Yeah, eighth day after the full moon, the Lord appears, and that is called Jana Bastami, Astami, like that. And the, but for the devotee, it's every day Jana Bastami. Jana. And the Krishna is taking birth in the heart of the devotee as the devotee worships the Lord more and more. So the Lord manifests himself in his form as Krishna and he appears in this world. But for a devotee, the Lord is always appearing in the life of his devotee when the, Lord, when the devotee worships the Lord with pure devotion. I'm not saying you have to become a pure devotee to worship with pure devotion. Pure devotion can be accessed or what we say acquiesced at any time if you have a, a desire to worship the Lord and that is your strength of your desire you still may still have material attachments but still because your devotion is, is pure then Krishna accepts the pure devotion aside from the fact that we are not fully purified so pure intention reveals pure devotion and pure devotion attracts Krishna like Krishna said, Bhakti Mahavajanati. I'm attracted by devotional service, pure devotional service. What is pure devotional service? Srila Rupa Goswami gives that definition. Ayabhita Sita Sunya, Jnana Kamana Anukulena Krishna Silanam, Bhakti Uttama. 
For devotion and real service means I'm not trying to gain anything by worshiping the Lord, nothing material. I'm not trying to be something by worshiping the Lord, trying to be a great philosopher or a great devotee, nothing. I'm trying to serve Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. So there are people who serve Krishna but don't have a desire to please Krishna by their service. That is not pure devotional service. It's devotional service, but it's mixed with some other motivation. When the devotee wants to please Krishna through the service, that is the motive of devotional service. So that conscious awareness of that I'm serving Krishna, but I want to make this offering, whatever I do, doesn't matter what the activity is, I want to do it in the best way that Krishna will be pleased with me with my endeavor to please him. Even though the service may not be per performed perfectly, still, if there's the desire to please Krishna, that is still pure devotional service. So that is, that is, can be done at any time, simply by the desire of the devotee. That let me serve the Lord, to please the Lord. And then we also play, pray, my dear Lord, I'm so fallen, I don't have any good qualities, but I know you are very merciful, so please accept this love service. In that way, one is actually gaining the full mercy of the Lord, because the Lord, the Lord will accept that and attempt to serve him, although it may not be perfect. That's Krishna's kindness upon his devotees. He is called Sarva. What is that? He takes the essence. Just like if you chant Hare Krishna, and you don't chant it clearly, but he knows you're chanting his name, so he'll, he'll accept the name. But still try to make it clear. <laughs> still try to make it clear. But still, he accepts the essence. He looks for the devotion. That's Krishna. So he's very merciful. So we can speak about his appearance in different ways, but for us, Krishna is always appearing according to the level of our attachment to Krishna, our service to Krishna. So every day, every moment is Janmasthi for devotee. It's not that we have to celebrate once a year and then the other 364 days. It's something else. <laughs> no, every day is an opportunity for devotional service, for spiritual realization and for getting more and more closer to Krishna in whatever we do. Okay. We're getting close. Questions? Comments? Yeah. Maharaj, um, I don't want to sound arrogant, but. Um, don't uh, sound arrogant. <laughs> 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 um, uh, you mentioned that Paritrana is Sadhana Vinasha Dushkutam, but after um, Krishna went back to the spiritual world, mm -hmm. Um, that is when Kali Yuga started and the decline started. Why wasn't it taken upward? Hmm? <coughs> why, why after Krishna returned to the spiritual world, why didn't... Why did Kali Yuga have to come? Why not the other way? <coughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's a principle of, of, of the appearance of great souls and the world. 
both when the great souls appear, they come, they establish religious principles, and then when they go, things go down. Unless there's a strong following to maintain those teachings and practice. Same with the Lord. When he comes, everything becomes auspicious. The earth actually becomes jubilant by the beginning. Just by the touch of the Lord's lotus feet. And she produces so many things. When she when he leaves, then the irreligion starts to manifest in her. And there's many stories in the Mahabharata especially illustrates that. What are the features of Kali Yuga and how Kali Yuga rushes in as soon as the, the Lord disappears. So for us, the disappearance and appearance of the Lord is a feature of his activities, but in another way, he never disappears away from the devotee as long as the devotee keeps him. So for a devotee, he can push back the effects of Kali Yuga by staying connected to Krishna always. Kali Yuga Pavana, Kali Boya Nasana, Sri Sachi Nandana Namre. Kali Yuga Pavana, Kali Boya Nasana, it means one who destroys the effects of Kali. Who is that? Sri Sachi Nandana Namre, Lord Chaitanya. So Lord Chaitanya actually chases away the effects of Kali Yuga in the lives of those who remember him and worship him. Same with Krishna. So for us, for devotees, there's no such thing as Kali Yuga. As long as you stay fixed in the Krishna's consciousness. You're, you go outside, it's raining. But if you don't have the, the proper clothes, you get wet. But if you, if you put the proper rain clothes on, although it's raining, you can stay dry. So the effects of Kali Yuga are everywhere. If you're protected by remembrance of Krishna and worship of Krishna, although you're in the midst of all these storms, you're not affected. It's up to you. <laughs> but for the materialists, Kali Yuga is just rushing in like, you know, like a freight train. And we can see it, but we're not affected by it. Sometimes we get affected by it, but it doesn't bother us so much. It's like when a mosquito get, jumps on you for a minute, you get a little irritated, you push them off. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Kali Yuga is like a, just a little bug that bothers you once in a while. But if you're in, if you're in material consciousness, then you're getting chased by a very ferocious dog. That's the difference. Any other questions? Mata Jane. Yeah. Uh, new beginner or somebody who's completely new, uh, which maybe like top one or two qualities we should focus on or try and cultivate uh, to teach him the chant and give him prasadam. <laughs> <laughs> These are the two most effective ways to elevate a person's consciousness. Prashadam and chanting. <laughs> I mean, people are not against chanting if we present it in a, an interesting way. Here's a way you can be free from stress. You can live somewhat a peaceful life. Just chant this mantra. These are names of God. And take prashadam. Don't eat food cooked. Cook simply for sense gratification. What is that verse? Shashashidam santo muchute sarva kilvisa. 
Vuchite te yakam papam ye pachakmana karanam. That food cooked for sense gratification must be a body, because it's safe. The bodies only eat yagya, food offered to the Lord, that is called yagya, yagya book. Krishna is called yagya book. So that is yagya, so perform nice, prepare nice vegetarian food offered to the Lord with devotion and distribute prasad. That is a very wonderful way how to purify people's consciousness and then inspire them to chant, read books. Thank you. We have so many books, nice stories, Krishna book, Krishna's pastimes. Any other questions? I have one question. Okay. It sounds stupid, but <laughs> it's bothering me so. Okay. Uh, so sometimes we do prayers, or like the thing is like we want to worship God, but uh, we don't out of ignorance. Like how uh, Paramita Madhuri was saying, I'm a beginner, so I don't know sometimes what are the rituals or proper you know, process to follow to worship God. So if we do mistakes, will God punish us? Or? No. If you keep making the same mistake, then you're not going to get the benefit. You learn by your mistakes. You should try to find out how to do it in the right way. That's where we have books and we also have teachers. So if you're doing some worship and you're thinking, I'm not sure if it's right or not, then you can ask, Hi, can, ask can you Get a nice, get a right understanding. So if we don't ask questions and we just go on without asking questions, then okay, can you we, we might be continually making the same mistakes over again. Okay. There's a way. There's a way to worship, and worship is not something we create. There's a way to worship the Lord. We have to follow that process. And the process is given to us by the pure devotees. So, yeah, everything is there. The knowledge is there. All you have to do is ask the questions. So what's your question? <laughs> um, and I keep bothering uh, Prabhuji, telling him Prabhuji, so... Yeah. You keep bothering him? Yeah. In what way? How do we worship? How do we stand? And that's all good. That. Does he help you? Yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's, that's good. he's showing us actually the way of spirituality. Yeah. You know, you need someone to lead the devotees and guide them in how to properly you know, worship. You can't create your own form of worship and expect it to be effective. But there are authorized ways to worship. So there's nine ways. Chant the holy names, hear about the Lord, remember the Lord, offer prayers to the Lord. These prayers are there are given to us by the great souls. We have so many prayers. We pray, we can do worship of the Lord by worshiping the deity. There's a certain ways how to worship the deity. Just like tonight, I saw a few anomalies in how it was being done, so we just made some corrections. Okay. So, yeah, there's a way to do it. Um, serving the Lord's lotus feet, that's another way to worship. Becoming friends to the Lord, surrendering your whole life to the Lord. These are nine process of bhakti. We call angas. But the most important one is to chant the holy names. And to hear. If we hear, then we understand. If we don't hear, 
So we don't know what to, how to chant, how to worship, how to pray. Everything depends on hearing. So you ask your questions, get your answers, and go for it. But if you don't ask questions, then, and you just go on, who can help you then? Nobody can help you. Any other questions? Yeah. I'd like to thank you for it. I it's been two years or maybe longer, but I could never figure out the details of Krishna's birth. It's very complicated, but today I think I I'm beginning to understand. I mean, beginning to I got the whole picture somehow. Thank you for the clear oh, explanation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Krishna's birth is divya, is transcendental. And it's also Gupta, it's hidden. So we're just trying to expand some of the basic meanings of Krishna's birth. But there's much more. Krishna is unlimited. And the reasons he does, whatever he does, is also unlimited. So we get a little understanding. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Maybe they are processing now, so they will come on Sunday when we do class at time. Mm -hmm. On Sunday they will ask more questions, maybe they are still thinking something. <laughs> okay. They say, when you listen to a lecture, two things happen. You get realizations or you get questions. If you don't get either one, you aren't listening. <laughs> In other words, you realize what has been said and you understand, oh yes, this is correct. And then if that happens, that means you're listening. Or if you don't get realizations, then you get questions. And if you're not, and so the thing is that you ask them. If you're not getting realizations or questions, you are somewhere else. <laughs> you're not here. <laughs> so the idea is to listen very carefully. So one of the ways to listen is that when the mind goes away, you come back to the sound. And that's called destroying the faults of the mind. Allowing the mind to gravitate back to the sound vibration because the mind wanders. Chanchalahi mana krishna pranati balabhadrika tasyaham nigaman maye mayabhaya idam satuskara Arjuna spoke that verse saying the mind is you can't control it, it's not possible. Krishna says yes you can, just practice. <laughs> he said I agree with you, it's difficult, but practice. So connecting to the sound vibration is the way to connect the mind to the soul because then when the soul is getting the benefit of the sound. So every time you see your mind going somewhere else, you bring it back. If you do that the whole lecture, you'll get either realizations or questions. Either one. Realizations, they come. Not to everyone, but to some. But if we don't get realizations, then we think, oh, well, I didn't understand that, or maybe this is something that I don't, you know. And then there's a question that comes up. Our Prabhu over there, he got realizations. He didn't have any questions. He just said, no, I, I understood Krishna's pastimes. <laughs> That's realizations. Just beginning. Just Something. Okay. So I guess we'll stop here. And uh, thank you very much. Happy Janmashtami. <laughs> 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 Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.
jail preaching and one about some aphorisms on Krishna consciousness. Um, one's called Holy Jail. The other one's called Forbidden Voices. Forbidden Voices is, is testimonies by people who are practicing Krishna consciousness in jail. Holy Jail is a, is a complete compilation of jail preaching all around the world from all angles of vision. And then we got the daily drops, is just aphorisms on Krishna consciousness. Little quick statements that are very, what we say, something you can read each day and get a little bit of a spiritual injection. So they're available for anyone. And see Madan Gopal and he'll uh, help you. Yeah. Thank you.